Factor Show. Episode 143. Sponsored by Rainier Ballistics, Hodgton Powders, and JPL Precision. All right, welcome back to Power Factor. I am Rick, and in response to requests we've had for three gun content, we're going to do some three gun today. And we brought Doug Hartley on the show. He's going to talk about three gun stuff. So Doug, why don't you give us a little uh, background? How did you get into three gun? What's your experiences? And we'll go from there. Okay, uh, I started shooting three gun in 2006. That was the first year that I actually had never even owned an AR before that. So I bought an AR, started shooting three gun. And that was a good year around here because we had the multi-gun nationals down in Albany. Right. So we shot that. Uh, at that year, they still had the area one three gun. Mm-hmm. And that was a pretty good match. And, then and that was local Curtis too. Yeah, was yeah. that at Marysville? Yeah, I believe that was in Marysville that yeah. year. Yeah. So, and that got me hit. It was a good start. I really enjoyed it. I shot, uh, tried to get into some other local matches, you know, uh, Carl Carbon's match out in Euphrates, tough right. to get into, that fills up fast, and so the first year I wasn't able to get into it, uh, R&R was still running their matches at that time, so I uh, I got into that the first year, and, and that made a pretty good first year for me, so, right. uh, you know, four, you get four or five big matches, that's that's pretty good to start out with. Mm-hmm. Now, when you started, did, were, were you, you had guns that you already owned that you pressed into service, or did you go out and shop specifically for three gun gear? Or? Well, I actually didn't have anything. In 2005, I started shooting USPSA, and I didn't even have a pistol. Okay. Uh, I'd been shooting air guns, air, field, air gun field target, which is, a, which is kind of a real precision air gun game. Uh-huh. Uh, and I decided, I'd seen it on the internet, I actually saw uh, from Kitsap, uh, they had a. They had a uh, something on the web talking about, you know, to come out for three gun packers and I'm like, ooh, three gun. And I'd never seen it, but I didn't even know what it was. Right. And so I went over there and I talked to uh, Marcus Carter and he said, Oh, you know, you need to get a pistol first. And so I bought a well, I bought a para uh, so I bought the forty uh, caliber, the one they have with double stack and, and I used that to begin with. And then by Christmas uh, the same year, two thousand five I thought, okay, now it's time to start buying stuff. So I bought my first AR and I bought a shotgun. This is actually the third one I bought. The ones I had bought at the beginning, I bought a Benelli and I didn't like it. And then I got a, a Remington Comp Master and that was okay, but it wasn't. So I kind of worked my way through them. And you really could spend a lot of money if you start, especially if you look at stuff on the web and you say, oh, that's the hot ticket now. Right. And you find out really that you're looking at stuff that's three, four years old. And so really it's not the hot ticket anymore. It takes and it that long to be yeah, on the web. Yeah. And everybody it, recognizing think, how great it is. Well, the thing is, at the time, I didn't know where to go with it. Because right. at the time... There was no I, Power Factor show at that time. There was no Power Factor so, show, true. And yeah. also, at the time, uh, I was just going to Google and, and Google and stuff and see what came up. Right. Uh, it, I don't know if you use Brian Eno's forums. The Brian Eno's forums I are... I go there occasionally. There's a lot of information on there, so you really, uh, you know, you can find out a lot more stuff without, you know, having to thump around the, the internet so much. Right. So it helped out a lot. Right. But uh, that was my first year. I've progressed on since then. I started out shooting tech optics mm-hmm. in the beginning. I think the first year I shot TAC optics at the 2006 uh, multi-gun nationals down in Albany, I think I came 65th out of about 76 people. So hey, you gotta start somewhere. almost at the bottom. So, yeah. but, uh, but things change, you know, and you get better and you learn more stuff. And sure. Now when you're, um, when you started in the competition, did, did you have the sense, this is what I really am going to get into and really enjoy it? Before you even really, had, I mean, because I, th- I mean, the show is generally uh, this is kind of intro to is the you know kind of our topic, right, right? And so I think there's a lot of people that they want to get into stuff, but they maybe need a little push, they need a little encouragement. Did you have this sense that for right from the get go, yeah, this is what I want to do, or did it? 
I, I did. In fact, that was like my original plan when I started shooting USPSA pistol was to shoot three gun. So you already had that. Right. I already wanted to do that. But the, but in the beginning, it, it is daunting. It, it's kind of scary in the beginning. In fact, I was you know I was nervous about going to my first match, and so uh, I, I hooked up with the guy from the from the Kitsap Range, and so he actually started taking me around to other places, and so I kind of found a buddy, and he, he kind of helped me get over the beginning stuff. So once you start getting going, it's not so bad. But you're right. In the beginning, it's tough if you don't know anybody. So I would suggest finding somebody. That, you know, getting with somebody who's at the range, local range you're at, and try to buddy up and, and pal around a little bit until you're familiar with some of the places. And then you kind of learn what to do and what not to do. And sure. I was told after the first stage I shot, you better calm down because you're not going to make it through the whole match kind of thing, you know? Because right. I was just like, yeah, that was great, you know? <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, it takes a while. And it's a lot of fun, but you have to really be careful. You can get on over your head. Right, right. Now, I, now we've got, you brought some of your gear. And um, one of the things that I recognized when I was shooting three gun, it's been some years ago now, is you never know what rules you're going to find in a given match. Is that still the case, or are they uh, starting to kind of come to a, no, a, a you, you, can, you can still have you can still go to five different matches and have five different rule sets. Is that right? But they are generally the same. But yeah. what you really need to do is before, when you sign up for a match, the first thing you should do is locate the rule set and mm -hmm. take a look at it. And and is there any kind of pushback against that? I mean, is there any? Is there just a sense among three gunners that I just need to know what rules are running rather than there being this push to kind of, why can't everybody have the same rule set? Well, that's the kind of discussions that you usually see on Brian Enos. And that okay. is, you know, on one hand, it's like, I wish every place had the same rules. And then right. somebody else says, hey, you know, every, you know, it's our match. We should be able to run whatever we want. I guess so. That's and that's that's what and what happens is you have the independent mindset. Like Scott Hawkins and I, we run our own match, and I don't want somebody coming telling me what I have to do. Sure. So, uh, you know, I took a set of rules, which was I basically copied a set of rules from another match, but then we've massaged it and changed it. And actually, every year we have some kind of changes based on input from shooters that, that they want to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it they they do morph. Even USPSA has changed quite a bit over a period. Well, of time. they were still using hit factor scoring back. I mean, when I shot right. in the 06 Nationals, right. it, I shot major pistol, minor rifle, right. and now they've got they've gone more in the direction of some of the other time right. yeah, plus the, penalty the time stuff. Plus, exactly, time plus is it seems like it's one of the most predominant scoring systems. So you'll find that in most places. You can still run into some other systems, but generally most stuff in, in three gun is time plus. Okay, so a new shooter should be aware that. Different matches are going to have different rules, but they're not usually radically different. They're going to be similar. Right. Well, that's good. That's good. I mean, that's certainly better for the, the the new shooter to not have to be too concerned about you know shooting five matches and finding five radically different rule sets. Uh, but you, the matches will be they'll post like on the forum, mm -hmm. their website, or the match. W Info will include. Here's what we're going to do. You, and it should you should. Be laid smaller out. matches may not have that, but all big matches should have that stuff posted on their website someplace. Okay. And there, and one of the things is majority. Like you'll find that most of TAC Optics is pretty the same. Most of Open is pretty much do what you want. But there's sometimes in limited or or in the heavy metal categories they may have some differences from from match to match. Mm -hmm. So if you shoot any of the ones that are a little bit different, that you know, like, like I said, heavy metal or limited, you want to check and make sure you read and make sure you're not going to violate any rules and end up in open. You know, right. Which I mean, is, I which remember when I shot uh, heavy metal, it had to be a single stack 45, mm -hmm. a pump 12 gauge, mm -hmm. and a 30 caliber rifle. Right. But then I've seen matches where they, they say, oh, it doesn't have to be a pump. Right. Or you can put an optic on. I mean, right. like now don't they have metal op heavy, yeah. heavy optics and right. heavy iron? For well, depending on the numbers, like sometimes you won't have enough to have. If at a really big match, you should be able to have all those different divisions. But like right. at our match this last year, only two people signed up for the for the irons, heavy metal irons. Right. And so we just didn't lump them all it. together. Yeah, we just well, we just tell them ahead of time. You let the people know that it was not going to be available. So sure. They have a chance to change before. I hate. I know it happened one time, and uh, I think it was down in Louisiana at the Multi Gun National where a guy showed up and was shooting the whole match and they found out later that uh, a big shooter hadn't showed up and now there was no division. Oh, nice. <laughs> and it's nice. like, nice, you know, you shot the whole match and you didn't find out till afterwards that you're, you're not going to get anything. Right, right. So it's tough. Yeah. So just, uh, let's just start in then with kind of an overview of the equipment rules, kind of in general, so we don't get too specific in terms of 
you know, uh, say how the rules are going to be at one match versus another match. We just kind of a general overview of how there's uh, what kind of equipment is appropriate or popular for the. I mean, tactical and open. Those are the major divisions now. They're the two biggest ones. Yeah. Okay. So we got your tactical gear over here. Explain what we've got. Maybe why you've gravitated to this. And is this stuff especially trick, or this is stuff that you've just, uh, it's your favorite, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we have over here? Okay, uh, shotgun is uh, pretty basic. This is a uh, an FN uh, SLP, which is a fairly common. It's not, uh, it's not considered top of the line, but it's not junk by any means. It's so, not, what would be the difference? I mean, how how what would differentiate that from a top of the line? What is uh, the Benelli guns? The more expensive guns. Uh, this, what, what benefit this, would you this get? Was, this is around six hundred fifty bucks when I bought it. They probably sell around the eight nine hundred dollar range now. You could spend salient tactical. You can get one of their you know really super duper Benellis for about fifteen hundred bucks. So you can. So, spend, what do you get for doubling your money and getting the Benelli? Uh, they smooth. This is basically has nothing done to it except the day that I bought this. I, I took my Dremel to it and started chopping it up so I can load it. And I still remember my wife yelling at me. It had just come out of the box and I never fired it before. <laughs> You're already and she's screaming it. at me, what are you doing? And I said, did you buy this? And she said, no. And I'm like, well, get the hell out of here. Right. I was like, I'm, this is my stuff. And so this was designed so that you could load easier. You could take your thumb and, and shove it in. Right. The original of these are very, very sharp in here. And even if you don't go to the extent that I did, you still need to knock it down a little bit. But this sure. is a basic run-of-the-mill automatic shotgun. Right, and you're loading, in tactical, you're loading one shell at a time, right? You're not using a speed loader. Yeah, you're whatever. not allowed to any, use any any paraphernalia like that. You right. can't use speed loaders, but people are sometimes holding four rounds sure. in their hand, yeah, yeah, yeah. or sometimes two, but yes, again, you have to manually push each round in. Okay. Okay. So that's, you're, st you're stuck doing that. And then you've got a capacity limit. Right. These, these guys generally at the matches now, they're eight in the tube and one in the chamber. Okay. Uh, some of the matches differ in that uh, some will not let you have any more than eight rounds in the tube ever. Mm -hmm. And other rounds are saying after the beak, you can do whatever they want. It, right. One of the reasons they did that was it, is it's tough for the, the range officer to sit there and try to count how many you have in your gun and how many you're loading in and right. how many did you fire. Right. So it makes it difficult. And if once you say, well, as long as you don't have more than eight in the tube to start with after the beak, you do whatever you want. And I've actually seen people not even start shooting the gun, the beeper goes off and they'll actually load some rounds in. Right. And I've seen some pretty long tubes that'll hold, you know, maybe 10, 12 rounds uh -huh. in the gun. Uh -huh. so and, now, and you've got screw-in chokes on there. Right, these are screw-in chokes and these are, uh, the reason I like the ones that are knurled on the outside is you don't need a tube, you, you can just kind of take them off with your fingers. Right. And then you also, it marks on the outside, it'll say what the, what the choke is. Okay. So this is modified. Right. So you don't have to, you know, there's, you can tell from the outside what it is. Now, do you find yourself altering chokes from stage to stage? I, I mean, depending on the requirements. Sometimes, uh, I I generally run modified in my open Sega, so okay. I have opened it up some. Depending, uh, normally I won't go any tighter than that, but I might go a little more open if there's a lot of wide open targets and not a lot of heavy steel. Because I I shot a, a cylinder bore 12 gauge, and there were some uh, stages I shot where the the pattern was insufficiently tight to knock down steel right. out at say 20 yards. Right. And so you're, there were guys screwing their full chokes in and whatnot just to address that. Right. And if you don't have the adjustable choke, what, so modified is a good modified, compromise? Yeah, you normally, you, know, you should have a, a range of chokes with you. So if you're starting out, and normally when you buy a new shotgun, they'll have some different chokes in it. Mm -hmm. Normally you'll get cylinder, you might get an improved cylinder, and then you might get a, a modified with it. Right, and is but everybody the, shooting 12 gauge? I mean, pretty much most, the most, board. Of, most everybody shooting 12 gauge, you can shoot. Uh, I, I know no matches that will not allow 20. So you can run 20, but most people just seem to run uh, the 12. There's more guns available for it and more parts and pieces. And so it seems like it's the, it's the choice. But I have seen younger kids sometimes shoot, shoot 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they can, those kids can do just as well. So shotgun. All right. And then your pistola. Yeah, this is. Uh, I brought this along because this this is uh, this wouldn't necessarily what I would be shooting in in uh, in tactical class. I might shoot a uh, like a you know an STI type pistol, but mm. but the Glock pistols or the, all the safe action pistols are really popular in three gun because you have to abandon guns in three gun. And so the nice thing about these is you never have to worry about if you got the safety on or not. If you're shooting a 2011 and you and your safety pops off, some of the matches depending on which one it is now you may get DQ'd. A guy DQ'd in Albany, right. he threw the gun in the box. They had a plastic like bin there, throws right. the gun in, 
safety's off, right. he goes home. These guns don't have that problem, so you can toss these as hard as you want, throw them in the barrel, wherever, as long as they're pointing down, more or less, you'll you'll be okay. So a Glock, Glock 34 is a good, good run-of-the-mill gun. Now, we were discussing earlier that almost all of the matches have migrated away from major and minor power factor on right. the pistol as well as the rifle now. I mean, as far that... as I know, I, there's no place that's really doing, except for the heavy metal categories, nobody really cares what you're shooting anymore. So 9 millimeters overwhelmingly popular. As long as you can shooting. knock your steel down, that's that, that's your problem, not their problem. So. Right, right. So now, uh, capacity advantage, I mean, you, you, is there, do you, does it matter if you've got 10 or 18, or does that play into it too much? Or? There, Well, there's no restriction uh, in tactical, except for usually length of magazines, where you try to run the same thing, like 140s, like most matches. Like I said, there's some that don't have any any restrictions. But so they're running big sticks, even in... I've seen that, but but generally you're going to look at 140 magazines. So you okay. could have an extension on your magazine and probably get you know around 20, okay. 22 rounds maybe in your Glock. But uh, now you're in, in tactical, you're limited, so to speak, to uh, iron sights on both the shotgun and yes. the pistol. Yes. But you're allowed optics on the rifle. Correct. Okay. What do you got going so here with this your rifle? Is, uh, this is a bastardized one I've thrown together. This is a parts gun that I built up. Uh, it's got a fairly new barrel I bought on this 18 inch uh, fluted barrel. It's running a JP4 arm and, and basically this is a this is a pretty basic AR. I, it's not very fancy it's just got an ace stock on it which is not a real expensive item. Uh, this has a, uh, a Timney trigger in it which is which is kind of nice. It's an upgrade over a standard but if you you probably could go out and buy a 16 inch AR and you could compete with it. Mm -hmm. You could just go to the store and probably buy a run of the mill one. It's not going to be perfect for you, but it'll get you through matches and stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you went and bought basically a shotgun like this, a relatively inexpensive shotgun, a relatively inexpensive AR, and, and a Glock, you could go compete in a match. Now, how does this gun uh, differ from, let's say, it, from the first AR you had? Mm -hmm. How does this differ? What, over the time of the experience that you've gained, what changes did you make? based on your experiences. One of the biggest things uh, that will really make a big difference besides the trigger, because the trigger is huge, mm -hmm. after the trigger is the forearm. So this is a free float, so it doesn't touch the barrel. You have the nut over here, and so this is free floated all the way around. It almost, almost rings like a bell. It's not touching the barrel. I can actually take it and tweak it sideways. Right. So when you go into a barricade and push on this, you can push as hard as you want. You're not going to touch the barrel, and your bullets aren't going to go off. And I right. have actually had that happen with my 20-inch gun when I had the shorter, I had the 12-inch uh, forearm on it, and I actually got into a position one time at Iron Man a few years back, and I was pushing, trying to get my solid position, and the bullets were hitting about a foot harder, uh, higher at 200 yards than I was expecting and pretty soon I was actually aiming in the grass I'm like there's something wrong with my gun you know I'm right. shooting down the grass and hitting targets but I mean I'm off by you know a, a good distance right. when I get done the guy goes you know you had your barrel resting on the thing. Like, so the long handguard isn't distance. so much so you can reach way the hell out there right. but so right. that when you rest the gun right. you're not resting it on the barrel because I, I don't normally reach out much farther than about there. I wouldn't. I would not. I'm not going to reach out to the end because it's. Right. I'm just not that big. My arms aren't that long, and I'm not right. comfortable like that. Right. But uh, then this is so that I, I throw it on a barricade. I don't have to worry about throwing the bullets off. Mm -hmm. So that that would be the second thing. Uh, optics is, is probably my other big thing that you need. And there's a there's a lot of optics now that are available. That and we probably should talk about that some other time. But there's a lot of optics. You probably want something one to four variable, mm -hmm. unless you can afford a one to six variable. Okay. So. And, and you're altering mid stage. Mm -hmm. You can, you can. Uh, they make throw levers uh, like this one here has an R and R throw lever on it. There's uh, ones made by other companies. It just makes it easier to change the power back right. and forth. This one actually doesn't have anything on it right now. I haven't actually shot this particular scope in a match, uh, but it, it would need if you wanted to go back and forth quickly. It probably it would help to have something. Mm -hmm. It's not absolutely necessary, but it helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you're shooting close target, maybe then a far target, then another close target, where you want to vary the power back and forth. Right. And since you only have this one optic, uh, you don't have a lot of choices. Now, they do make offset iron sights that go on the side. Right. So you could use that in tactical. You could use the offsets and then roll your gun over, use the iron sights up close. And Rather just than leave. dialing in one power, exactly. just use that. And iron. that's a little faster. Some people do that. Right. Uh, Duke Defense makes a nice set, but there's some other companies that make offset uh, 45 degrees. So they basically would sit over in this area and then when you shot the gun you just roll the gun over and then you could see you could see the iron sights. Right. Now the muzzle brake is that something that's continually evolving over time or there's 
somebody that's always got the hot ticket that everybody migrates to, or you just find one that you like and you stick with it? Or? Well, it seems like everybody makes them, <laughs> so everybody's got their own hot tip. They say they have the hot tip. Right. Uh, but does the word go out, hey, try this one, I mean, among the shooters? Yeah, and there's, there's always a lot of stuff. This is actually a Cooley comp. Uh, I've been using those since I started in 2006. Seem like they work pretty well. I don't have too much trouble with the guns bouncing around, okay. So, and especially with the heavier gun because I'm shooting at 20 most of the time, which also has the Cooley comp on it. It's, right. So you're not like constantly but they, searching for. But the, they do have. There are different ones, and sure. there are people. Uh, you know, Benny Hill down in Texas makes one, and you can tune it and right. drill holes in it and do all this stuff to it. And so those are popular. Some people because right. they, you know, me, I personally, I don't think I have a problem with my comp, so I don't worry about that much. But but other people that you know, it depends on your build, how strong you are, you know, how hot your rounds are, and how light your gun is. I mean, it's a lot of factors involved in having the gun. But you want to be able to just sit at close range and just pump rounds into a target without too much work. Now, what would you attempt? to these rail sections. I actually set this up for the uh, the night match, the Crimson Trace night match. Okay. So I have it up so you have a light rail and a, and a laser rail okay. on front. Actually, if you look at my 20 inch, I also have a setup on there. I didn't run a laser this year at, at that match. I ran, because I have dot sights, red dot sights. It's, to me, it seemed like it was easier. Mm -hmm. Some people said, oh, you should really try the laser, but I, you know, I didn't do it. So, right. but I have, but you got to have a bright light. So it's nice to have it out as far as you can on the end, because the farther back you get it, you throw a shadow, right. and so you'll end up with this big shadow where you're shooting, and it doesn't work as well. So the nice thing about this is that you get it out as far as you can, and there's not much shadow. Uh huh. So. So is there anything else? I mean, we, so we've covered the trigger, the optics, uh, the, is there a... Uh, uh, grips, I, I mean, basically everything on this gun is, I, I built this gun pretty much from scratch. Uh -huh. So everything in here I, I put on it, but the majority, if you end up with a, a halfway decent gun that shoots fairly well, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to change the barrel out, you get yourself a nice trigger on it, and you get yourself a, a free float forearm, you should be able, good to go. Now, I notice uh, you're a right-handed shooter, mm -hmm. and you have the standard AR controls on there. Mm -hmm. Do you do much shifting from shoulder to shoulder during matches? Is there any advantage to, say, having ambi controls on it if you're shooting from your left shoulder as a right-handed shooter? I, or? I actually have done that. I've had, had to switch occasionally at matches. They'll do that. The really mean match directors will do that to you. And I have done it. Uh, I haven't really noticed at the time. Normally, I don't put the safety back on. I have right. actually try not to manipulate the controls when I sure. do something like that right. and not fire that many rounds. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you don't have to change magazines backhanded, too, which isn't much fun. But, right. Uh, it, so ambi controls. To me, sometimes you, you put so much junk on a gun that you actually you run, into, run into more problems. But sure. I have I have another I won't say the brand, but I have another uh, type of lower that has a uh, it has a bolt release on the left hand on the right hand side. So the oh, bolt okay. release is over here. Another one, so it has two bolt release. Ambi bolt release, beautiful beautiful lower. I found that. Uh, when I was getting ready to shoot the gun, I would get I would go to drop the magazine and I drop the bolt and then I go to drop the bolt and I drop the magazine and so right. I was confused and I decided that maybe that's not a good sure. great really pretty little lower but I didn't want to shoot it in a match because yeah. because I'm not used to it so you're sure. better off for me personally I like to use what I'm used to all the time that's yep. why when you'll see me at a pistol match I still have a I still have a uh, an AR magazine holder in the back. It doesn't have an AR magazine in it. I, I don't move my magazines around. I, I try to keep everything the same. Mm -hmm. That's just the way I like to operate. Everybody's different. Some people, they have these new systems where they can attach everything in their belts and take it off. And every single every single match, they're switching stuff around. Or every right. stage, even, they're changing right. things. And so I, I, don't, I don't go to that. I, I like to keep things the same. So now, uh, in terms of your the gear that you do wear on your belt, are you limited to, for instance, I noticed you've got uh, what I would call kind of an open style holster. Mm -hmm. Is that free in Tactical Division? Any holster yeah, that's most like of, USPSA legal is going to yeah, be satisfactory? Yeah, there's really there's not too many problems. Now. In fact, USPSA even let, went to drop holsters, so they said you can even have a drop leg holster, which you can't use at a regular USA pistol match, but you can use it at a three gun match. Okay. So things are pretty pretty open in terms of what you can use. Uh huh. And most matches, they really don't care as long as your stuff doesn't fall on the ground. Right. Uh, so, you, but so you have the same limitations on, for instance, uh, or no limitations on, for instance, where the where the holster is located near relative to your hip bone and some of that stuff. Right. Is, no, all that stuff is gone. Yeah. There's okay. no uh, like like you would have in production. Right. No, there's there's none of that stuff in there. So, so you, you can, can essentially put the stuff wherever yeah, the you like. The problem is you have so much stuff, especially like you have you know you might have shotgun holders here and you got all kinds of stuff. Because I run open, I just I run a little a little pouch that holds my magazines off the side, and so I don't I don't really have much else on my belt besides this. So this is the same rig you use for both. 
both tactical and open. Yep, just and and I would use it for a, a pistol, U.S. a pistol match too. Sure. So I, I try not to move it around so that everything's always in the same place. Mm -hmm. That seems to work for me. Right. Okay. Well, so now let's get into a little more exotic stuff here. St okay. Still, we're still working with a two-two-three rifle, nine millimeter pistol, and twelve gauge shotgun. But dramatically more trick. So, right. what do we have here? So, uh, one of the there's two big differences when you go to open with your rifle. Uh, you can have an extra optic. So, in this case, I have a, a side dot. So, I actually have a red dot sight mounted on the side at a 45 degree angle. So, when I'm shooting with my main optic, if I want to go closer, I can just roll back and forth. So, I can leave my main optic set at a higher power right. for longer shots. And I have this one set. This one actually is zero to 25 yards, mm -hmm. and it hits dead. I, don't, I could put a little tiny group at 25 yards, so I can just roll it over, and I know I'm hitting right where I want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is, you get to have bipod. Right. So bipod makes life easier on long, long stuff. Right. Now, do they? I seem to recall that there was a rule back in the day that the bipod had to be folded at the start signal. Is that still in place? I'm pretty sure most places you can start. Start with a down yeah, yeah. Okay. They, they've some of that stuff was over the years was a little silly, you know. Like, yeah, I mean it's just uh, it's just interesting though to see how the the rules evolve or devolve depending on how you look at it. Well, I think one of the things is USPSA really wanted to go get the mainstream three gun shooters. It's not a really big community, and so they really didn't want to have themselves kind of priced out of the market like you'd have you know you have these these guys over here they're uspsa three gunners and they can't do anything else and they wanted to get rid of that stigma so uspsa has become much more friendly to mm -hmm. uh, to three gunners over the last couple of years in fact this year at the because uh, i ro'd the, and shot the match the last two years mm -hmm. and uh, in the ro meetings they've told us that that they don't want any stupid dqs mm -hmm. that they, we don't want any gotchas don't play that game you're here to assist the shooters make sure to be safe and make sure they have a good time right so if you see something about to happen don't go oh i'm gonna get him and oh i got you they don't want to see any of that crap right say so, you know if you see somebody going to do something stupid say hey excuse me don't do stupid don't, don't take, yeah don't take that's the ammo you know that's a safety table don't take your ammo over there right you know be be helpful not sure. ag aggressive and, and nasty to people so because they were worried they were getting a bad reputation and it's the matches are much better the last couple of multi-gun nationals have been very very good matches mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. good as almost any match in the country really good good so uh so we've got your are can you run as many different sight sets on there as you want? I mean, you can have th three optics or irons, backup irons, whatever you want on there in terms of sighting. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, at some point, you, it gets a little carried away. Sure. But uh, yeah, if you want to run multiple optics, that's cool. Then nobody cares. Okay. Uh, now, I still, run a, I still run my best optic because this is my main match gun right now. And I've been shooting this for about three years, and I really like it. This is a JP upper, uh, so it's a very, very, very good quality uh, a barrel. And also, I run in the low mass recoil system so you have a low mass buffer and then you have JP spring and then you have their uh, low mass carrier and so it, it really has a nice impulse I have a, a tunable gas block so I can tune the gas so that I get the least amount of uh, impact so when I'm shooting and the gun's not recoiling really very badly so that's that's one of the big thing that makes this gun nice and you shoot and it's got a little bit heavier barrel and that doesn't seem to bother me so I, I've keep, I keep trying to change to an 18 inch gun mm -hmm. and go to a shorter gun and I just keep coming back to this 20 inch gun because it just shoots so good um, now we didn't touch on rifle uh, mag capacity is mm -hmm. there a limit on how many rounds you can start a stage with or how many rounds you can have in the gun at any given time some of the matches differ on that one so generally in open it's it's anything goes so you see mags oh, I mean, yeah. whatever you want yep yep and, and some of the some of the matches they don't care in in, in tactical or limited there's and then like i said those are one those are places where you have to check with each individual match and find out uh some some matches actually they won't let you have the the two matches the two magazines connected together mm -hmm. and if they're even they have to be offset by an inch or two okay so that you can't rest on one of them because they think it's a you know a, it's like using it like a bipod so, okay. yeah, I'm talking. Yeah. There's different rules, so you have to make you sure have to that know. you're. Yeah, because you don't want to go to a match and do that and then find yourself an open. Sure. Because then you're then you're a guy with a with a, a shotgun like this stuffing in one round at a time, and over here I'm sticking 20 rounds into the pop, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not you're not going to have be able to compete. Sure. Sure. So. So anything else, uh, any other, I mean, you've got an adjustable stock. Right. And now it's even got an adjustable cheek piece. Right. So you now can this, raise it up yeah, and down to suit your optics. Yeah, this is the Magpul PRS stock. One of the reasons I put that on there was that this is this is a little bit barrel heavy, and so it'll find out that if you get too much weight in this end, now it doesn't balance, so you're kind of nose heavy. And I like it more balanced. It was still a little bit heavy in the end when I went to the uh, when I went to the 15-inch JP front end. So this is uh, a Carbon Arms 
uh, one of their tubes. They don't make this anymore, but they this went right onto a JP nut. So I just unscrewed the other one, stuck this one on. So it took it a little weight off takes the, the front. Out. Yeah, and you, to you, you, you it see out. how it's it's balancing right where my hand is right there. Right. So the center mass of the gun is right about where the pivot pin in right. is. And, and I really like that. That to me that works good, even though it's a little bit heavier than some people like because it's balanced. It's easy to move. Mm -hmm. It feels so, lively right. even though it's heavy. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And then when you go and you you know you, you're down prone or you're shooting long range, because of the weight in the front of the gun, it can stay on target easier and see mm -hmm. what's going on. So, cool. All right. All right. Now, open. Now again, we've got optics on every gun in Correct. open. What do we got going for? So a this pistol? is a, this is actually a uh, John Larson built gun, JPL Precision. This is a, a nine millimeter major gun. Mm -hmm. So you can actually shoot nine millimeter the regular production rounds out of this, but you got to change the spring. Mm -hmm. And I've done that quite a bit when I started running out, so I just started building, you know, open big rounds. So I, I got the I got the uh, got the full power rounds in here, and so it, this actually shoots very very nicely. I like it. It's a it's a, a short version, you know. It's a, it's a little bit shorter than a regular one. I just happen to like the shorter gun the way it handles, uh -huh. uh, and it's got a Seymour optical sight on the top, so that. It makes it really easy to hit stuff. The biggest thing I've noticed with this is uh, some matches now are, are putting little steel out of ways, and so you have these really tough shots. Mm -hmm. With an open gun, they're really easy. Right. So on iron sights, you see people some you know struggling with these. Uh, you know, very often I'll get one shot even on the little tiniest stuff far out. Now, are the uh, like capacity and whatnot? Are the rules fairly consistent with what you find in USPSA Open in terms of how many rounds you can load? Yeah, and a lot. Some of them don't have any limits at all really? on these guns. Yeah, okay. either, you'll either see the 170 limit or you'll see no limit at all. Just mm -hmm. bring, you know, run whatever you got. So, mm -hmm. but most people don't run them any bigger than that. I mean, my big sticks are running. I, I normally put 28 rounds in them. I can get 29 in, but it's kind of kind of makes it a little tight. I don't like it, so I so I run 28 rounds and. Uh, I don't seem to have too much trouble with it. Mm -hmm. All right, so now uh, probably your trickiest piece of gear is your open shotgun. So mm -hmm. why don't you go into what the heck that is? Okay, so this is a Kalashnikov design. Uh, this is basically like an AK-47 design shotgun. It's built in uh, Russia by Sega, and this is a Sega 12. So the Sega 12 is uh, is pretty a pretty basic shotgun, and this has been heavily modified by R and R targets to make it into a really nice open shotgun that feels more like an AR-15 than it does like a Kalashnikov. Right. So you notice the say the Kalashnikov safety's gone from this side. A big magwell has been op uh, added on the bottom. The uh, the gas port's been gone, taken back about two inches from where it normally was, and a big compensator has been put on the end. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it has an AR-15 style, st style st stock, and the trigger's moved forward and polished up, and then you got a nice AR-style grip. So you can put any kind of AR uh, buttstock on it. You can put any, any kind of AR grip on this, and it feels you feel right at home, and it matches up with what you're shooting as a rifle. Right. So you also have an uh, optic sight on here because it's open. I can do pretty much whatever I want. Right. And the other, the biggest part to this though is the uh, is magazines. So when a guy's over here with his regular shotgun and he's loading one round at a time, I can take this. This holds 20 rounds, and I can just take, <laughs> and I have 20 rounds on tap. Right now, is there a limit? I, I know I'm kind of harping on this. Is there a limit to the number of rounds you can load or have loaded? It's just whatever will fit, whatever the gun will Whatever run you can with. carry, whatever, yeah. Because at some point you reach a limit as to how much weight this will take and, and sure. go back and forth. I mean, this stuff's made of plastic. The, these magazines, typically for the Sega, are plastic magazines. So they're only going to take so much aggravation. Uh, like I said, this is 20 rounders. This is actually two 12 rounders together. So when you stick this on, you, you have. 24 rounds in here plus mm -hmm. the one of the gun. So you have quite a bit of weight moving back and forth. Right. Uh, so and that was why R and R made this big magazine well is, is to give it a lot more support. Not to make it easier to put in, but to support the so magazine. It's not weaving around. Right. So when you got it in there, it would actually hold it in place. But this is a, and this gun shoots really fast too. And as long as I feed it the correct ammunition, I normally shoot the double A's out of this thing. I shoot the uh, the one ounce that are like 1,300 feet per second uh, mm -hmm. super forts. Thing runs like a clock. Hmm. Now, and, the, uh, when this thing comes from Russia, or when they came from Russia, mm -hmm. it looked more like a conventional AR, uh, AK. Correct. And, and, then, and then all this and customizing. And there's no grip. Actually, the, the Segas don't have a grip in this area either. They have a regular 
shotgun so that the stock would be more like this shotgun. Okay. Oh, okay. And then the triggers move forward and parts and pieces, some pieces are cut off and other pieces are added. Right. Pretty much every part of this gun has been changed to make it what, into what it, it is right now. And is that now the hot ticket in open? Is everybody shooting that or is it, are there they're, still they're people s- muddling along with tube fed guns? or? Well, you mean like guys like Jerry? Well, and that's, Mexican. yeah. I mean, I always, it, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, when I used to watch the guys in open with those, mm-hmm. those, whatever the heck you call those things that they carry in these bags yeah. on their leg, it just looked so cumbersome. And this seems so much more natural right. for people who are used to loading the I would the say bags. that some of the old timers, uh, like Mike Voigt and, and Jerry Michelak, he, they are still staying with the tube guns only mm-hmm. because I think they're so good with them. Right. And they're so fast and they know how they work. Instead of learning a new system, they just... Right. And they probably don't shoot that much three gun, mm-hmm. you know, maybe four or five matches a year. And that it really doesn't pay for them to go to a new system, and then you have to break in new guns and all. They have stuff that already works, and I, I think that's why they stay. Now you go down, you step down the ladder a little bit, you start to see guys shooting a lot of mag fed shotguns, mm-hmm. and and the R and R. Uh, Sega 12 like this is probably one more big matches than any other one. Mm-hmm. So I would say this is an excellent ticket. This is an expensive ticket, but it's an excellent ticket. There are some other options out there, uh, but as of right now, this is probably the best one you could go with. Mm-hmm. So, and then uh, the belt and the holster, mm-hmm. same same that you use. I in don't open change and- anything around. The only difference is that I add a uh, I add a magazine pouch. So I had to have a cloth pouch that hangs off my left leg, and I just take the magazines and I just stick them right in. Mm-hmm. Now, when you do, uh, I don't, I don't want to jump around too much, but uh, when you do load the tactical shotgun, are you using the the uh, thing on your belt that holds the the right. shells horizontally right. yeah, like shell so you can pull them right. out yeah they have ones that hold four shells or hold six shells and they have some fancy stuff now that you can grab two you know next to each other at a time so the two mm-hmm. load system there's been a, that's actually where a lot of stuff has changed in in shotguns and the tactical part is how guys are loading those shotguns to go faster and so the speed of loading a tactical shotgun makes a huge difference in a match especially if you have like a 30 40 round course of fire you're only starting with nine in the gun you got a lot of shells you got to load yeah. and so that means the faster you are you're going to be even if you're shooting the same speed as the other guy if you can load faster you can beat him so can you handle four at a time? I mean, is that I, I have done that when I was doing it. I, I did. I used uh, I used the strong hand, so I would actually roll my my gun up this way and then put four in and load them that way. Mm-hmm. But it's it takes practice. It's right. not something you do the first day. So sure. if you want to get good at it, you really have to do it quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I stood in my basement and put four on the bench so I could pick them up just perfectly, you know. And I could I go, oh yeah, if I spent hours and hours at this, I could probably do it pretty well. It takes time. It takes, and if you want it, you want speed, and you want to be good, it takes time. But you, but anybody can go out and, and load and, and have fun. Mm-hmm. So I mean, and, and most people are not going to win matches anyway. So the idea is, you know, the biggest thing is you go out, and you go out to have fun. Yeah. You know, and that's the biggest thing I think about three gun is that it's a lot of fun, and, and everybody's under the same constraints that you are. So you're yeah. all working together. And I shot the three gun for four or five years, and I didn't really buy any specialized gear at all. I mean, I I loaded my shotgun from a Essentially, a bandolier that I wore around the bottom of my at the bottom of my sternum, mm-hmm. so I could load like this, and I would just work the gun around like that, loading one shell at a time. I never got into the fan- fancy those fancy you know store bought loaders, um, and I'd stick my rifle mag in my hip pocket mm-hmm. and use just my regular pistol belt. And if it, the stage required some a specific stage required that I uh, I only had to reload the pistol once or whatever. I might just, you know, I'd carry one mag rather than mm. five mags. But I had all my pouches and stuff on there all the time and didn't do a whole lot of tailoring. You know, mm. I mean, I, like you mentioned earlier, mm. you've got these modular belt systems now where you can pull your pistol mags off and put your shotgun uh, shell carriers on. And mm. um, it seems like there's just the, the sport has evolved. I mean, I remember. Uh, I, and I think it coincided with uh, Michael Voigt's being elected USPSA president. USPSA really pushed three gun for mm-hmm. a number of years, and now we've got uh, three gun nation on TV right, and some of the right. stuff. And I think right. you know the sport uh, has become somewhat mainstream. But I know the reason that I got out of it was the expense of the ammo, and not just expense, but availability. Even if you can afford it, a lot of stuff uh, it's hard to get. How has that affected the sport or your your participation? I think there's some some people this year kind of felt it a little bit, the pinch and ammo, but I think most of the people that I would normally see for matches before still, still saw them this year, and uh, 20, 
13 has been a pretty good sized year. I mean, most of the matches have been filling up. So okay. there's people everywhere. I, I think it could be part of it is there's a lot more shooters now coming out. A lot more people are shooting three gun. I, I would say probably, you know, five, six, seven years ago, that was a smaller community. Mm -hmm. The community's gotten bigger, more people, it's more mainstream, like I said, more people are shooting it. And so it's not that hard to fill up matches. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to do a, a good job and, and practice and you got, you have to spend some time and you got to spend some money mm -hmm. and get mm -hmm. some gear and get some ammo and go out and learn how to do it. Now, one of the things I notice in pistol competition is uh, a lot of times, like say at USPSA Nationals, they'll do these, a report on what everybody was shooting, mm -hmm. what kind of equipment, what kind mm -hmm. of bullets, what kind of ammo. How does uh, what the top shooters, the guys who are winning the major matches, how is what they're shooting different from say what a local club level shooter would have? I mean, I've seen the uh, guys messing with uh, Bigger bullets, blur, getting away from two, two, three. Mm -hmm. How much of that is filtering down, or is it all still pretty much the, at the very upper level? Yeah, I think the AMU did some of that stuff. Yeah. So, uh, and I know they they came up with thirty caliber Gremlin and some other stuff that they were working on. Uh, I don't think it's it's really because USPSA went away from major power factor with rifle. It's, it's kind of a moot point now. So there's right. no sense in running an AR-15. That has a big fat bullet and trying to make major power factor right. because it does you don't save anything. Right. So in that sense, that really has kind of gone away. Okay. Uh, now the the actual equipment, I, I really I've seen I've ROed basically every big three gunner in the United States mm -hmm. and most of them multiple times, and I would say that they're not running much more fancy equipment than the average Joe is. Okay. So the good. average guy, I mean, what I have on the table here is is good enough to win any match in the United States. Okay. So, so it really is. Not, I mean, you have to have a certain level of equipment, but it's not a equipment driven once you get to that point that's right once you have your good optics right. and your and um now and i've won matches with the gear that's sitting on this table yeah okay. but not not i have won the only national match that i've won is the nordic components uh, shotgun match i won that two years in a row with my green shotgun here yeah. in, in open so yeah. that, that shotgun runs pretty good and right. i and i the first year wasn't that great a competition but the second year i bought some i beat some national level people so i was cool i was happy so but uh, but when you put the whole three gun together i'm still i still struggle a little bit here and there you know my pistol's probably not as fast as it could be i'm only a b-class shooter mm -hmm. so you know i'm shooting up against people who are gms and stuff i mean they right. those guys know how to shoot guns <laughs> I'm, and I'm still struggling, but but I normally finish about you know 75 percent of where they come in. So okay, well that's, that's not horrible, but yeah, it's, well that's it's, good. That's good. You don't win matches at 75 percent. Right, right. Yeah, I'm well aware of that. So there's your intro, your first introductory intro to three gun. And I want to thank Doug for coming on the show. No uh, problem. Cool gear, and uh, this will be the first in a series. So don't think you're not going to get to see Doug in his cool gear again. Um, if you're interested, uh, giving us some feedback, have any questions for Doug, you can go ahead and send them to the show, uh, powerfactorshow at gmail.com, go to the website, powerfactorshow.com, or if you know Facebook and you like Facebook and you like us on Facebook, you'll know the Facebook address. So uh, until next time, we'll see you at the range.